One of the fastest moving types of cancer is pancreatic cancer. Our guest on this episode of the Cancer Interviews podcast has survived stage four pancreatic cancer. He is Matthew Rosenblum of Hazel Park, Michigan. I'm your host, Bruce Morton, here to share with you Matthew's story. So here he is. And Matthew, welcome to Cancer Interviews. Thank you so much for having me, Bruce. And we look forward to hearing your story. Now, Matthew, it's our custom to start off the same way with all of our interviews, and that's to learn a little bit more about our guest, which is you, your life exclusive of cancer. So if you would tell us a bit about where you're from, what you do for work, and what you do for fun. Ah, well, um, I was born in New York. Um, I was born uh, on the North Shore of Long Island, and when I was... A uh, kid, we moved to South Florida. I grew up in a place called uh, Jupiter, uh, the northernmost uh, suburb of, well, close to the northernmost suburb of Palm Beach County. Um, and I, you know, I went to school at Florida State and got a degree in geography and then went on to the University of Kentucky and did my graduate work there. And I've bounced around a lot in the last few years, um, but uh, yeah, as you said, now I live in uh, Hazel Park, Michigan, in a, a, a nearby suburb of uh, of Detroit. Um, actually, right across the the border of Wayne County and Oakland County. Um, I the the uh, the question about what I do for work is uh, in a former life. I was a PhD candidate and a teacher um, at the University of Kentucky um, and have not worked for several years. Um, pancreatic, metastatic pancreatic cancer is a, is a disability um, uh, that you are, you know, not expected to, to uh, uh, you know, really return to work after you're diagnosed with. Um, and so I haven't worked in two years, but uh, I am uh, I'm I'm back on the job market, um, and um, as as of recently, um, returning to the uh, professional world and really hoping to work in cancer advocacy, um, patient centered, patient informed cancer advocacy. Um, for fun, uh, as you can see, you know, I just got off of an airplane uh, and I didn't, uh, it looks like a, a, a crazy person lives here. It's just, uh, uh, I read a lot. I like to read. Um, I also like to watch, you know, true crime documentaries. Um, I, you know, I like a, a dimly lit bar and good conversation. And uh, I'm, you know, sort of, I, I'd like to think of myself as easygoing in that regard. Well, let's talk about your cancer journey and where it started, because for all of us who are survivors, there was that point in time in which we thought we were healthy until we weren't. There was that point in time in which something came up that seemed kind of abnormal and that, that uh, triggered a chain of events that led to a diagnosis. For you, how did that manifest itself? Golly, well, this all started in um, early 2021, um, like uh, almost th three years ago now, um, the, um, uh, the early 2021, um, January 2021, I started, I had, I had moved to Durham, North Carolina, uh, this, you know, COVID was going on, and I had lost my job. And uh, luckily, a friend of mine, uh, in Durham, he was having a surprise, as many people did, a surprise COVID baby, and he needed help, and I needed a place to land, so I went there um, to help him out, and, you know, two months later, the business closed, as so many did over during the pandemic, and his family left and went up to, uh, you know, went up to New England, and I was, you know, I, I stayed behind in Durham, and I was in a strange place, pretty much by myself under stressful circumstances. And about, um, you know, in early 2021, um, after they were gone for about two months, I started to experience uh, the symptoms of obstructive jaundice, uh, standard symptoms of obstructive jaundice, um, mostly. It's different for everyone, but um, 
you notice that your urine becomes very dark, your stool becomes very light. Um, and in my case, although not in every case, um, my, my uh, skin itched quite severely. Um, and it was always at night and it was, it, well, it was worse, the worst at night. And it was the bottoms of my feet and the bottoms of my hands. So two places that are, you know, very difficult to scratch. Um, and this lasted for about two nights. Um, and finally, you know, at first, I, I honestly, I, I really, I had no idea what it, uh, was happening. The night before, I had had a few beers and I thought, well, I'm older than 30 now and, you know, I'm over 30 uh, and maybe it's just a hangover. And so I drank Gatorade and, uh, you know, uh, I tried to uh, 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 recoup a little bit. Uh, the symptoms just kept getting worse um, and the itching, it's like the closest I've ever felt to being tortured before. Um, it was it was horrible. In fact, I used to that first night in order to get to sleep, I finally I broke down and I turned the knob on my tub to as as hot as I could get it the all the way. Um, and I just forced my I, I held my hands and my feet under it for as long as I could um, because it would numb the sensation. I'm at this point a 32 year old i i have some experience with a serious you know a health issue because i'm uh I, I have a chronic illness i have crohn's disease but nothing like this i knew it wasn't good the itching i i was terrified um because i'd never felt anything like that before and i was very scared and i go to an urgent care uh, because i'd only been in town for a short amount of time. I hadn't gotten a doctor yet. And I remember going to the urgent care and the um, woman shines, a, the, the nurse practitioner shines a light in my eyes and she says, I don't know, do they look yellow to you? Um, and I was like, well, I don't know. <laughs> I, I remember laughing and it's like, I don't know, you have a light in my eyes. I can't, I can't see them. Uh, and um, it turns out, you know, she, she does some blood tests and my liver enzymes, AST, uh, alkaline phosphate, bilirubin, um, the, they're all um, elevated, um, significantly elevated. And at first the uh, nurse, you know, she's like, she, she genuinely, she was like, are you, uh, because there's symptoms that are similar to a serrated liver, uh, and I was I it took me a while to to convince her like no, uh, I, you know this is something else. This is, um, but yeah, that's how it started um, with the severe itching, uh, the um, pale yellow pale stool, and, uh, and 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 very very dark urine. Um, I, I know it's, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's kind of, uh, my, my girlfriend laughs at me when I have to talk about the symptoms associated with pancreatic cancer. It's like, uh, I have to talk about, you know, going to the bathroom, <laughs> but, uh, that's honestly those that, yeah, that's how it started. By the way, we're confident you'll be able to learn some tips and tools to help you through your personal cancer journey. But first, we'd like to invite you to give us a like, leave a comment or review below and share this story with your friends. If you would kindly click on the subscribe button below and click on the bell icon so you'll be notified the next time we release an interview. And if you or a loved one are facing a cancer diagnosis, please click on the link in the description and show notes below to check out our free guide the top 10 things I wish I knew when I first got cancer. And Matthew, we'd like to, to get to that juncture. At what point were you diagnosed? And I, I know quite obviously there was, this was terrible news, but uh, what was your reaction to that terrible news? Okay, well, the, the first part of your question is kind of complicated because in my case, as in so many other cases with pancreatic cancer, it took quite a while to get there, um, especially because of my age. The average pancreatic cancer patient is around 70 years old. And at this point, 
I was 32. Um, so at first, you know, I, I, when we get my blood results back, I, sh sh the nurse practitioner calls me and after the, you know, are you, uh, uh, uh you know, drinking, uh, talk, uh, after we move past that, she's like, you need to, you need to go to the ER, right? You don't have a doctor. You need to go to the ER. So I, I go to the ER and they do an endoscopic, they do all kinds of things. I had, uh, an endoscopic ultrasound. I had all manner uh, CT and MRI. Um, they did some, you know, took some, uh, well, after they, the imaging comes back, they see a stricture in my bile duct, which is what caused the symptoms. Um, your liver produces bile. It moves uh, into, through the head of your pancreas and into your colon, you know, the sort of the quick and dirty of the digestive system. But um, if there is a stricture, that means bile can't move through to help digest your food. So your body deposits it elsewhere in your urine. Uh, um, and evidently, in my case, in your flesh, the bile salts evidently are what uh, cause the extreme itching um, and the reason your stool is white is because bile is partly what gives gives it its brown, preferably brown color. Um, that's the last I will talk about going to the bathroom. Um, but <laughs> anyway, they, they say there's a stricture in your bile duct. We don't really know what it is, what, what's causing it. We're going to put a stent in there. We're going to get some test results back. We play back and I, I, I spend a weekend in the hospital they send me home, but they're like, there's nothing, you shouldn't be concerned, right? No one is, no one is very concerned. I have Crohn's disease. There is po possibly an autoimmune explanation, although there, you know, it's possible that there still is an autoimmune explanation for my situation in some regard. Um, but um, no one is concerned. This goes back and forth. Finally, Several weeks later, they decide they're going to take my gallbladder out. They take my gallbladder out, and everyone's like, you should be fine. Um, and this is now, we are in, we're in March of 2021. We're moving into April of 2021, and my symptoms come back. And then I, I get really freaked out, and they put another stent in. Um, at first, they put the stent in. They're like, we don't know what the stricture is, the, you know, the narrowing, but we're just going to put a stent in there and we're going to stretch it out. And hopefully that works. In retrospect, it sounds nuts to me, but uh, uh, that's, you know, they, I, I, I was confident in them. Um, uh, so the, 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 the gastroenterologist puts another stent in um, after they had removed the previous one. And she's, she, I, I have this uh, appointment with her, and this is now April of, we're at the end of April 2021. Um, and I have a, a meeting with her to discuss some of my results, but everything I'd seen so far that I, I'd gotten on my phone, all of my results that I'd seen at that point, nothing, no one was talking about cancer. And I get to this appointment and the, the GI, the endoscopist says, well, and she's, you know, I, I tell this story all the time and not to shame her or anything, but she says to me, well, you definitely do not have cancer. You do. She said, you definitely do not have cancer. If you had cancer, I would roll over in my grave. And then two hours later, we get the rest of the, the results, and, th and I'm at work at this point. I'm at work, and I get, I, you know, to, when my friend left, I got a job as a, a front-end manager as a gro at a grocery store just to put some money away, just to be able to get out of, you know, Durham. Um, and I'm at work, and I look at the results, and it says adenocarcinoma on it. And I did not know that word, but I know enough that, um, I joke now that uh, cancer words sound like the bad guy from Star Wars, adenocarcinoma, uh, it, um, 
in any case, um, yeah, that is how I found out. Um, I found out that I had cancer from my phone. But at this point, no one is talking about, no one had even men really mentioned my pancreas, <laughs> except for like a few offhand remarks about its size, for whatever reason, on uh, uh, in the radiology reports, no one ever mentioned pancreatic cancer. If you read my medical records though, if you there's like a little history that they wrote. And if you go back, it says that suspected ampullary or pancreatic adenocarcinoma. But I remember at the time, because an hour after the, the MyChart app told me that I had cancer, the surgeon who took out my gallbladder called me. The case had been referred back to him because he was the person, he, he turns out, uh, he, he just happened to do my gallbladder surgery, but he's also an uh, experienced and accomplished uh, um, surgeon the, uh, who does the, the, um, the particular surgery for pancreatic cancer, a Whipple, a pancreatoduodenectomy. So my case is referred back to him and he calls me and to his credit, and I love this guy, uh, he, he calls me on his personal cell phone while he's at a conference to put me at ease. But I remember what he said to me. He definitely, he thought it was ampullary cancer. I, I remember he was like, you know, this, if this is cancer, it's a small thing, we'll be able, we should be able to get this, right? He was not concerned that I was going to die. Right. He was not he was not that was he was not trying to put that in my mind. Maybe it was in his mind, but that's definitely not how he uh, talked about it with me. The suggestion definitely was that I had a less deadly form of cancer than what I turned out, uh, what it turned out I actually had. In any case, because the ampulla, uh, a part of your digestive system, is so close to the pancreas, they, they do uh, the same surgery for it. Um, so he says, you're going to come in. It's, it's a very quick turnaround. And often it is with pancreatic cancer. Uh, well, it should be. Um, in my case, it was. Um, four days later, three days later, four days later, I was in his office doing the pre-surgery song and dance. Um, and a few days, a handful of days after that, um, in early May of 2021, um, they attempted a pancreatoduodenectomy, a Whipple, uh, which is where they remove part of your pa affected pancreas, roughly a third of your stomach, part of your part of your colon, your gallbladder if you have one, um, and then they basically redesign your digestive system, um, and. So I go in for the surgery, they open me up, they find that it's a, a tumor on the head of my pancreas that was what was pinching my bile duct off and that, not, that it had spread throughout my gut. And with pancreatic cancer, once it has spread, you, um, they don't generally do the surgery on you because the... Uh, Gosh, uh, the the outcomes are are worse. At, at least conventional uh, scientific wisdom says. So I woke up in the hospital, and my surgeon. I could tell that something was wrong. My surgeon. Um, well, they had me positioned. I don't know if this was on purpose, but like I couldn't tell what time it was. I was kind of in a corner. They said, you know, my doctor had to go into another surgery after mine, but a Whipple takes a long time. So that seemed unlikely to me. And then I saw the nurses watch and I realized that like, it wasn't really enough time. Something was wrong. And the doctor comes in, my sister is there and she is, she, she I can tell this is not good. And he, he gives me the news and, um, he tells me, gosh, the, the, the truth of it is um, that in my mind, um, gosh, 
you wake up from surgery, and this is pretty major surgery, and you're, I'm going to be honest, you're on a lot of painkillers, and the guy tells you something, and, and you, I knew it wasn't good news, but I felt silly, and I think I was, I was cracking jokes uh, in the room. I knew, and eventually I stopped, but like, I knew what he was telling me. I knew as soon as it came out of his mouth, because I knew enough about pancreatic cancer to know that I was not in a good position. Um, I, it, it wasn't real for a very long time. I, I, I will say that it got real before I left the hospital. I was there for seven days because they, you know, they cut me from the bottom of my sternum to the bottom of my belly button. They didn't do the surgery, but like they still cut my body open. Um, and I, I laid in that hospital room for seven days and I ate chicken fingers for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every meal for seven days and watched all of the Harry Potter movies over and over again and didn't shower and watched The Real Housewives and just did whatever I wanted. And for the most part, the nurses uh, let me do that because uh, they, you know, your chances of being, the chances of being diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, at least from what we know, and I believe that the data is really soft. Someone who, as someone who's trained in the social sciences, like I'm, I'm pretty sure there's a lot we don't know to be making these kinds of claims with the, the certitude that we seem to have. But like, according to what we know, the chances of being diagnosed like under 40 with pancreatic cancer are so are are, are extremely low. Um, and so they just and you know, I had to adjust to the idea that, you know, after being a 32 year old, you know, still pretty young, still with most of my life ahead of me, I had to uh, I had to to learn how to reconcile myself to what I always knew would come, but was now coming much quicker. And that's, that's how I felt when I was diagnosed. Did, did that, uh, was that all of the, the questions? Yes. And uh, if, if you would, Matthew, tell us just in the ensuing weeks and months, um, just how did you go through everyday life and, and what could you do and what could you not do? Well, um, so my, my surgeon told me, he, you know, after he gave me the news, there was a suspicion that I was BRCA2 positive, that I had a genetic abnormality, a BRCA2 germline mutation that um, as a person of Eastern European descent is like pretty common. My, my sister had it, and that's why there was this suspicion. Um, my mother died of breast cancer, um, when she was 56 years old, um, he said, because I was BRCA2, uh, because I had this genetic mutation, because I was roughly 40 years younger than the average patient and, you know, comparatively healthy, um, he thought that, he said, this is a mean cancer, but I think in a year after treatment, we could be back here trying the surgery again. Um, as a person who has a BRCA2 mutation, um, I am more likely, it, it's mostly associated with breast cancer and ovarian cancer, but it also increases your uh, likelihood of, de of, of uh, developing pancreatic cancer. At this point, he said, you know, you're going to do chemotherapy for a year, and those therapies, because of all the research done for breast cancer, there, there are more options for you. Um, he, th he said, he, he said, I think that your case could be a unique one. My oncologist at the time was not as bullish. He, he came to visit me in the hospital and he said, um, you know, we're going to let you heal. We're going to give you a few weeks. So the incision heals. And then you're going to start a chemotherapy cocktail called Fulfurinox. Um, and in about two weeks, I started Fulfurinox. And um, I don't know if you've ever met someone who's done, uh, who's gone through pancreatic cancer before or has dealt with uh, chemotherapy for pancreatic cancer. 
Um, but Fulfirinox is the kitchen sink. Um, all, all treatment for cancer is bad. Any kind of cancer is bad. But uh, Fulfirinox is, it is awful. Um, before that, before I started chemo to shrink my tumor to see if they could, uh, you know, uh, do the surgery at some point in the future, I, I was fine. The, the incision, it, I, 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 up until I started chemo, between the aborted surgery and chemo, I lived a regular life for the most part. Chemo, I remember coming home from the first session, and this was, by the way, May, the end of May 2021 is when I started chemo. Um, and I remember coming home and thinking, this isn't a big deal, I can do this. Um, and uh, that lasted, I will say, I. so many people, when they're diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, for a variety of reasons, um, they, they, they don't last very long. Um, and it hits you like a ton of bricks. It took a little while longer for me because I guess of my, you know, age and health or whatever. Um, but when it did hit me, it hit me like a ton of bricks. At this point though, I'm a single guy living in Durham, North Carolina. Well, no, I, I was in a long distance relationship at this point, but I'm by myself. Uh, my friend, my best friend uh, moves from uh, Senegal to uh, Durham to help care for me. Um, Fulfirinox really did a number, as it does for so many people, on the nerves in my hands and my feet. Um, the neuropathy was pretty bad. I lasted through the summer. I made it to September. Um, of 2021. Uh, May is when I started. The first scan they gave me, they said the tumor shrank a little bit. By September, the radiology report showed that not only did my tumor grow a little bit, but it spread to my liver. Um, and uh, and that day, I remember, I'll never forget that day because it was that day when I finally told my friend, I said, I don't think I can do this anymore. I, I couldn't even get out of a chair by myself at this point. I'd lost uh, probably about 50 pounds before cancer. I was, I'm six feet tall. I weighed about 215, 220 pounds. Um, and at this point, I'm like... 150 maybe it was it was uh it was not good but as you know i guess uh, what came to mind was uh as luck would have it but not really a, a, a luck situation but that was the day when they they said well this chemo isn't working and i was relieved at this point I was not confident that i was going to be something special um, and I really, I couldn't take it anymore. And my doctor, uh, he said, well, it's not working, so we're going to try something else. And so they put me on a different cocktail of, um, gemcitabine, abraxine, and, oh, one more. It'll come to me. Um, and that was more livable. I, I begrudgingly, I, I, I accepted uh, that, you know, all my friends, my little sister, everyone wanted me to live. And even though I didn't really, I kind of just wanted to give up at that point because I didn't think anything, I, I things weren't moving in the right direction. Um, but I did it because of them and I'm happy I did. Um, but it was much more livable um, treatment, I was not, I was not incredibly nauseous. I was not, um, I didn't, I maybe, I can count on two hands, uh, more than, maybe four hands, the number of times I threw up through a year of chemotherapy. Um, I was mostly just nauseous. I, I stopped working eventually. I did I did five months of, of through that summer of from May 2021 to September of 2021. I worked 40 hours a week on my feet. I wore special gloves 
because of the nerve damage in my hands if I was going to touch something cold or hot. And I, I worked until I literally could not work anymore. I, I wish, in hindsight, I hadn't, but um, I didn't really know. You know, I was so scared of not being able to afford, you know, of not having health insurance. Of I, I just, I insisted on working until I literally couldn't stand by myself. Um, so my quality, to answer your question then, uh, in as I so often do in a long and roundabout way, um, my quality of life was bad at first. I was very depressed and Fulfurinox is thankless. It is horrible. Um, it's maybe the second worst thing after that itching. That's the second worst feeling I've ever felt. Um, but eventually my quality of life improved pretty significantly. And I mean, I trap I, after chemo, I would wait a day or two. I would get on an airplane. I'd wear a mask and, you know, I was vaccinated. And perhaps in a lot of cases, it is uh, not the responsible thing to do. But like at the time I thought, well, my chances of surviving are so small anyway. I might as well. Like I hated living in Durham. I didn't want to stay there. I would fly back to Kentucky. Uh, and that's where I went to graduate school. And, you know, my mom died when I was at in school there and it became home. So um, I would fly back and forth from Durham to uh, Lexington. Um, so the so long and short of it is uh, quality of life, not so great, but it got better. You had mentioned how uh, you're going to soon be looking for for work, get back in the workforce. It sounds like your quality of life has improved since then. Yes. Is, is that fair to say, Matthew, that uh, the quality of life yes, is much better now? Uh, yes. I, I, sorry, I didn't want to. Uh, I, I felt like uh, I have a tendency that is to uh, over answer the question. And I was trying to reel myself in. But yes, um, after when I, I started the new chemo cocktail, my scan results were so good that my pretty soon, I think it was the first scan, the first three months after uh, starting the new cocktail, my oncologist, the one who told me when I badgered him that I might have one to three good years left with treatment was like, and, and, and was not as confident as my surgical oncologist that I would be able to revisit surgery said to me, he's like, if your next scan is good, is like this shows improvement. I'm going to suggest that we try surgery again. The spots on my liver disappeared. And by March, then this is of, of 2022. Um, that, la that next scan he, or this was three scans in, yes. Um, he said it, it, that it looked good and uh, we revisited surgery. Um, and they cut me open and um, they, I guess the word is non-viable. The tumor was, the biopsies were good. My, uh, all of the lymph nodes that they checked were good uh the spots on my there was there was not and has not been evidence of metastatic recurrent or otherwise since then um re recurrent metastatic disease that is uh since then um and yeah uh you the the uh, learning to live after this kind of surgery and after the trauma of, of, of being told for a year you're going to die, and then they're like, ah, never mind, not just kidding, you're not going to die. And uh, the emotional whiplash of that, the l learning to re-eat, le learning to eat again, because they've redesigned your digestive system, dealing with the after effects of chemo, the nerve damage. <sighs> I'm thankful to be here. I'm tremendously thankful to be here. Um, and I'm tremendously thankful for the quality of life that I have. Um, I 
I live a pretty full life now, um, but it was not an easy road. It is not an easy road. Um, and it's not always linear. And um, there are days where it's be much better than others. Um, but yeah, you know, in general, my things are, things are pretty good. Fantastic. Our guest is Matthew Rosenblum of Hazel Park, Michigan. And Matthew, we want to thank you for being with us. This is really an inspirational story for anybody who watches this who's been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer because pancreatic cancer, lung cancer, these are two cancers in which, in many instances, when people are diagnosed, they're already in a late stage. And that, yes. that means a huge hill to climb. So, Matthew, we want to thank you very much for sharing your inspirational story with us. And uh, thanks for being with us on Cancer Interviews. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. And that's going to wrap up this episode of the Cancer Interviews podcast. We want to remind you, as we always do, as we conclude, that if you or a loved one are on a cancer journey, you or they are not alone. There are people out there just like Matthew who have stories, who have information that can be of help to you when you make your way through your cancer journey. So until next time, we'll see you on down the road.